Hello, 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 beautiful people. I hope everybody can hear us out there. Can you guys hear us? I can hear you. <laughs> All right, here it comes. Okay, can you guys hear us out there? Sometimes it's yes loud and proud uh can you speak uh, what we're trying to do right now is make sure dr strong we had to call him from google hangouts because he's having trouble with his laptop so he's going to speak right now and i need you guys to let me know if you hear him hi dr strong oh how are you did you guys hear him Great. Okay. So thanks for tuning in to the live hangout tonight with Dr. Strong. How are you doing this evening, Dr. Strong? Very well, thank you. Uh, we have Dave in here as well. He has been trying to help us with some tech issues. Um, a little bio here on Dr. Strong. One second. Dr. Strong received his undergraduate degree in astronomy, and he has a PhD in high energy uh, astrophysics from the University of London in 1979. He studied X-ray spectroscopy for his PhD thesis at the Muller Space Science Laboratory. He launched two solar, solar sounding rockets from Woomera, did I pronounce that correct, Dr. Strong? Woomera, South, South, Woomeray. South Australia. He was briefly an astronaut candidate, um, specialties, um, solar physics, space weather, how solar variability affects the Earth. He worked as a research scientist at Lockheed Martin uh, Advanced Technology Center in Palo Alto, eventually managed the Space Science Division. His group built most of the solar imaging instruments used by NASA and NOAA agencies. For example, SOMAX, Yoko, the Hinodote, uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Hinode. Hinode. Soho, Trace, SDO, Iris, Goes In, and Goes R series. Also, he built the Earth imaging instruments like Epic and Discover and Burr on the Goes R. He was a NASA advisor. And he chaired the NASA Sun Earth Connection 2000 Roadmap Committee. He has published over 200 peer reviewed papers and a book, The Many Faces of the Sun. He retired in 2007 and lives in Maryland, in the Maryland suburbs of DC. And as a hobby, he runs a YouTube and Twitter channel, Dr. K. Strong and debunking pseudoscience in the media. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Strong, to help shed some light on the cycles of the sun and the reality of climate change. So well, I'm inviting me. It is I'm I'm very honored to have you here. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right on in. Uh, what I have here, I have um, questions and also claims that I see both on uh, Facebook groups and on YouTube. So first question I have here is, do you believe that the sun can influence the Earth's weather? Indeed, over the long term, of course it can, because if the sun's intensity changes, the temperature of the Earth will change. Um, for example, over a billion years ago, the sun was 30% less intense than it is now. So that's obviously going to change the temperature of, of the planet. Correct. But if you're looking to try to explain the short-term variations like global warming with the sun, I think you're fresh out of luck. 
Right, right. Um, can you guys uh, in the chat see um, my screen share? I'm hoping everybody can see the screen share. Uh, let me pull up the chat to make sure. Uh, can you guys see the screen share? All right, excellent. Okay. Has the IPCC taken the possibility that the sun has a role in climate change? Well, there's a lot of people out there that claim that the IPCC uh, um, has ignored the sun in its various assessments of the climate. Uh, that is untrue. Initially, um, the first couple of IPCC reports were, were done in the early 90s. They didn't really know very much about the solar variability in the total solar radiance. And in fact, my book, The Many Faces of the Sun, was the first book to actually uh, flesh that uh, problem out. Uh, but ever since then, uh, the most recent reports uh, have featured quite a lot of information on the sun. In fact, several of my colleagues have actually served on the uh, IPCC panels. Uh, Peter Foucault and Judith Lean, for example, were on uh, one uh, panel that I know of. So th these are very prominent solar physicists, and their opinions were taken into account. And if you look at the reports, it does, in fact, mention the sun quite often. OK. Um, the sun varies on approximately 11 year cycle. Does the solar cycle influence the weather of Earth? Yeah, if you could show figure one rather than figure two, okay. that would be helpful. Here we um, go. There we go. Can you see it? Uh, I can see figure two. I can't see figure one. But uh, anyway, I, could, I can make do with this. I just put Oh, there it. you go. There you okay. go. Okay. What I've done here is I've plotted the uh, temperature anomaly for the Earth in. Uh, in that uh, stack plot, blue shows below average temperatures, red shows above average temperatures, or the averages of, for the 20th century. And I'm superimposed upon that in green, the timings of the solar maxima for, the, for cycles 12 through 24. And if you look at that, you can see no particular warming during the periods of solar maximum. There's no, there's, some of them are lower at that time, some of them are higher, just, is, just sort of random. So there's no real effect. And if you back off to solar minimum, which is about three or four years before that, again, you have a similar thing. Some are high, some are low. So there seems to be no particular pattern to uh, a timing pattern uh, to link the solar cycles with any warming or cooling periods um, for the planet Earth. But you can check that a second way. And if we could go to figure two, we can do that. Okay. It should, it's um, we can actually compare the sizes of each one of these cycles. Uh, with um, the uh, uh, with uh, the warming, so the largest cycle, which is solar cycle 19, should have the maximum amount of warming. And as you can actually see, it has one of the smallest amounts of warming. Right. Uh, some of the smaller cycles, actually, uh, like cycle 24, has the maximum warming. So again, even if you either on timing or amplitude, there seems to be no relationship between the solar cycle and um, the uh, uh, the the te the, earth, the earth temp temperature of the Earth. Okay, so okay, can we gauge the size of the solar effect on global temperatures? Uh, it's a very complicated. It's a very compl complicated. Hello? I'm getting some sort of interference. I'm getting, getting that. Um, Are you getting that I echo again? again? I need figure three. I need figure. Okay. And you're getting the echo again, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, crap. <laughs> I'm that's so sorry. That's the technical term I use. Yes, that's, that is the technical term I would use for that. Oh, crap. I'm sorry. Um, I let, let me see if about the uh, problem. Is, is, is it giving feedback to the other folks there? Okay, let me check right quick. Are you guys getting uh, feedback? I think, uh, yes, I think echo, echo, echo. Yeah. 
Can, are you getting a feed? Is it going away? Well, they said uh, no. no. Are you still getting it? Everybody says no, they're not getting feedback. I had to talk without uh, feedback. So if I'm in a that. Okay, in figure three here, I've. Okay, I have to pay that the um, sun's uh, intensity at the surface of the earth can change. The first one is the a total solar radius, i.e., variations in the sun. So here is the, shown at the top here in the first figure, there are three cycles. And you can see that they're relatively small. Um, they only vary by 0.1% over 11 years. Um, I'm just trying to so zoom in, very, in very a little bit here. And it keeps jumping back to that one every time I'm trying to zoom it in. Okay. Don't bother to zoom it. I think it's okay as it is. Okay, there we go. I will zoom it back out how it was. And there we go. Anyway, so the change in total solar radiance is very small compared with the overall cycle. Uh, over a period of a year, the distance between the Earth and the Sun changes because the Earth's orbit is elliptical. Uh, in uh, January, it's closest to the Sun, about 147, uh, 147 million kilometers. In July, it's furthest away from the Sun at 153 uh, million kilometers. That creates a 7% change in the total amount of radiation hitting the Earth. It's due to the uh, inverse square law. So that is 65 times larger than the change in total solar radiance over a 10-year period, over an 11-year period. So now, even bigger, consider the seasonal changes. So uh, the, the altitude of the sun in the sky varies by 43 degrees, uh, uh, 46 degrees over uh, a period of a year. So in summer, when the sun is high above your head, you're getting a lot more radiation than you are during the winter uh, when the, the sky. I've done a quick calculation here, degrees. That, that would be at Montreal, by the way. Uh, that um, the change between summer and winter there, the amount of radiation hitting the, uh, the planet, that part of the planet is a factor of about two and a half or 258 percent. That effect is 2,300 times larger radiance. You seem to be jumping around on the figures here. I'm not quite sure why. I, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I did so, that. I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, so you could take a look. If you've got a factor of 2,300, you can take a look at the change in temperature from summer to winter in Montreal, and that's about 30 degrees centigrade, which would imply when you divide 30 degrees centigrade by 2,300, uh, that the, uh, the TSI change would be of the order of 0 0.02 degrees centigrade. Very indeed. Now that's a very rough calculation and you should really do the models properly and all the rest. Uh, that gives you some idea of the order of magnitude. We're not seeing a modulation with the solar cycle. We're not, uh, and when there are, much, there are much bigger effects around that we hardly notice anyway, so um, the solar cycle is going to be uh, a very small factor. So basically the sun and the climate are moving in different directions. Well, we'll come to that in a second. Okay. All, the, all I've established at the moment is that the solar cycle is not affecting Earth's temperatures in any significant way. Okay. We, we can uh, um, look at uh, the, uh, if we go to figure four, that's the next figure. Okay, Can we get the next figure? We, yes, and then we have the question that goes with this, I believe. Uh, do you believe that the sun is causing the increase in global temperatures that has been observed over the last 50 to 100 years? Well, you, your no. point is exactly right. If you look at the, the last, this is, a, the in blue here is a plot of the number uh, over the last seven solar cycles. And you can see that there's a general downward trend. Now, that's it. So that means the sun is getting less active over that period. That's exactly the same period when global warming took off. So they are, in fact, going in opposite directions. Oh, yeah. This curve would have to be the other way in order to be able to explain global warming, and very steeply, I would might add, and, and it isn't. Correct, okay. Um, 
here uh, we had talked about um, some of the other cycles that uh, people have been talking about. Um, Sarkova has a cycle of 400 years. Uh, Casey has a cycle of 200 years. And then there's the Gleisberg or Gleisberg cycle of 88 years. Um, we have about 150 years worth of reliable sunspot data. It is hard to, this is a quote from you, it is hard to get a reliable a period, period, I'm sorry, periodicity for an oscillation when you don't have the data stretching over multiple periods, assuming it is cyclic. So, Maybe show, show figure five. Okay. Can you see it? Not yet. It'll get there soon. <laughs> I think you have a little bit of a lag since you're watching it. Yeah, this is the, the all the solar cycles that we've had recorded to date, going back to 1750. Really, the only reliable data that we have is from about 1850 onwards. The observations were sparse, and um, and there were arguments about how you should record sunspot number. And uh, different scientists did it in different ways. So there's lots of uncertainty over the first 10 or uh, But so if you look at the arrows below, the G there is the length of the Geisberg cycle. So we have only really one and a half Geisberg cycles of uh, reliable data. So that's very hard to establish a, a periodicity for that. And then there's a Casey's 206 year. And all he's done there is basically said, yeah, Dalton minimum was um, 206 years ago, so we're going to go into a um, a new uh, a Dalton minimum, uh, so the period must be 206 years. So uh, that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, we've actually we've had this all sort of thing before. People come up with these various cycles um, and, and claim that they've solved the solar uh, variability problem. Um, Ten years ago, we had a young lady called Matsumi Dupati published a series of papers predicting that the next cycle 24 was going to be large, and then we were going to go into a very low uh, uh, cycle for the next two or three cycles. Um, and of course, cycle 24 was not very large, so her model was wrong. And I think the, the Zarkova uh, has done a similar sort of thing. She's managed to solve for all the previous cycles, but the acid test will uh, necess not necessarily be the next cycle um, because one of the things, they, you know, they say it's going to get very small. Well, what can happen from a cycle? We've got a small cycle at the moment, 90, with a peak um, a sunspot number of 90. Three things can happen. It can either, the cycle can go, the next cycle can go up. It can stay the same or it can go down. So you have a one in three chance of being right. That proves nothing. Right. Uh, it, in science, you need uh, like a one in a hundred chance. So after four or five cycles, we might have an answer, but most of us aren't going to be around after that to prove whether these two folks were right or wrong. That makes it very convenient. Yeah, of course. Uh, and all these alarmist talks, you know, if you can go back to 2007, 2006, 2009, and all the same people that are claiming that we're going into a grand solar minimum uh, we're claiming back then that, that, that solar cycle 24 wouldn't be here and uh, we would be in a grand solar minimum by now. And some of them were even claiming that we'd be in an ice age by now. Yes. And of course, we've just, we've just got the most, uh, the highest temperatures for the last, um, I think, three years. So uh, that doesn't uh, really uh, make any sense whatsoever to my way of thinking. Okay, well, you kind of covered uh, some some of the uh, grand solar uh, minimum claims here. So let me scroll down a little bit. Um, I was going to talk. Well, well, when oh, if you go to uh, six, I can tell you show you how well we did on predicting the, <clears throat> cycle twenty four. Yes, yes. Uh, the well, it said, uh, but the forecast is for a grand solar minimum and the onset of an ice age, will that make a difference? So we were going to discuss uh, the predictions, how how it works. Right, well, here I've plotted the 
uh, forecast peak of the uh, of solar cycle 24 and the amplitude of solar cycle 24 uh, on the same plot. And every one of these uh, little diamonds is one of those is one of those project projections. The red circle is the actual maximum. You can see very few of us got it right. Um, and so, uh, you know, the uh, the chances of a uh, uh, you know, of 104 uh, predictions, we uh, got no basically nobody got it right. Uh, and this, these are the best solar physicists in the world. Uh, so from that point of view, um, we uh, uh, we still can't predict what's going to happen in a few years' time, let alone 20 or 30 years down the line. And these folks are just making this up uh, that we're going into a, a, a grand solar minimum. Uh, the, the chances of that are very remote. And even if we did go into a grand solar minimum, it wouldn't cause an ice age. Right. And um, um, you were saying that um, we were only using losing about 0.1% of the incoming radiation? Well, actually, it's less than that because that's the peak to peak. That's uh, the variation from the maximum to the minimum. Of course, the average is half of that. So we're losing 0.05% of, of the radiation if we went into a, 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 sol, a, a grand solar minimum. And that is basically negligible. And we wouldn't notice that. Right. Okay. And an interesting issue. Is there any evidence of the Monder minimum? Or um, can you can you tell our viewers about the Little Ice Age and the Maunder Minimum? Because some people keep thinking that the Maunder Minimum was the Little Ice Age. A lot of people don't understand how long it lasted. Right. The, uh, a lot of people say, OK, the Maunder Minimum occurred when there was ice on the Thames and all the rivers in Europe were frozen and we had no summers and things of that sort. What they don't realize is the Little Ice Age started in 1350 and went on to 1850. The Maunder Minimum went, started in 1640 and went on to 1710. So basically the only accurate thing scientifically you can say about the Maunder Minimum is that it happened to occur during the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age started long before it and went on well after it. So there is, um, so again, you can't make no link. Now, one of the possibilities is that it might have made things slightly cooler during the time of the Maunder Minimum. That, that we can't really tell. However, if you look at a plot of all the, um, uh, of all the um, uh, reconstructions of the uh, a Little Ice Age, the lowest point on, on there that I think I remember was about uh, 1690, which would be before the Maunder Minimum. So mm -hmm. again, it doesn't fit. And there are a lot of studies that have been done that show that um, the Little Ice Age was started um, between, I think it was 1275 and um, 1350 or something like that, where there were volcanoes that erupted. There were major eruptions that happened, and then there were things that fed it, that continued to feed it to, right. to make it... Well, they there, there are several theories of what caused the Little Ice Age, and it may, it's probably a combination of them. One is there was a lot of volcanic activity back then. The second one is that that was the time of the Black Death in Europe, and about a third of the population died. Um, and so there was a lot of land that was laid fallow, and trees started to grow there. So there was a lot of agricultural production. Uh, trees started to grow, so that took carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and also cooled the planet, the fact that there was a canopy there and not, um, and not uh, wheat fields and things of that sort. Uh, so from that point of view, um, there's lots of reasons why the, uh, the Little Ice Age happened. But it basically is a phenomenon of um, uh, the North Atlantic Basin. If you look at reconstructions like the hockey stick from going back through that time, the Little Ice Age and uh, the... Um, uh, a lot of the, the, the so-called warm periods, the medieval warm periods, just disappear when you take the whole planet into account rather than just the, um, the part of the planet where we were keeping records. Right, right. That's something that a lot of people don't understand, that it was not global, was it? No, it was not. Okay. Okay. Um, do other stars show similar behavior as the sun? 
Yeah, if you go to figure seven, I can show that. Um, yes, other stars do show um, uh, solar cycles. Um, with it should pop up for you soon. I'm sure you have a little bit of a lag. Yeah, okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yes. Um, studies of stars, in fact, what they do is they look at a couple of the lines in the, in the star's spectrum, uh, the H and K lines, and those uh, lines indicate how much magnetic activity there is on the star. And if you measure the amount of um, uh, that uh, of um, change in that that flux level, it actually shows you how the cycles of the stars are going. Uh, still not on Figure Seven yet. Um, it it is it should be showing. Uh, have you got figures? At the moment, these sure. I have. Let me make sure they guys. Are you guys seeing uh, Figure Seven? Yep. Okay. Everybody's seeing figure seven. So what it is, is because you're watching it, you get a little bit okay. of a lag. So you should be seeing okay. it very soon. Figure, you will see that several of the other stars there, the sun, I think, is, if I remember correctly, is the second one in from the uh, top left. Okay. Um, but you see there are other stars there that show modulation rather similar to that of the sun. Um, and... Uh, they uh, are, some of them have longer periods than the sun, some have shorter, some have much bigger cycles than the sun, some have smaller. Now, if you look at the ones on the right, there are a few of them that look fairly flat lined. And this has been an argument for years that uh, this shows that they are in their, their own equivalent of more than minima. Uh, however, recent results think that some of those stars, at least some of those stars, may actually um, be misclassified and are not the types of stars that would have a uh, solar cycle anyway. So that uh, whether the, any other stars are in the more minimum, I still think is an open question. Right. And it, it's not something that we can exactly know until, you know, we have to have a little bit better technology, right? And well, you have what, to... you need is, what you need is more telescope time because what you right. need to do to do this is you need to point a telescope at hundreds and hundreds of stars yeah. and measure what, what these H and K lines are doing in, the, in their spectrum. Uh, day in and day out, and it, it's very hard to get telescope time uh, to do that sort of study. So um, uh, they've done it for a few dozen stars, but that's all. Um, so from that point of view, uh, we don't really have enough data to, to and a long enough period to track um, uh, whether any of these stars have actually gone into their own more domina. Now, we've had people study uh, isotopes in, in various um, uh, ice cores and things of that sort to look for when the sun went into equivalent of Monda Minima. And uh, the average average period for that is, is about 400 is about four hundred years. Okay. Uh, however, period varies 50 years to 1,000 years. By saying that, you know, saying that the Monda Minima was 400 years ago, so we're now due for another one, uh, is, is nonsense actually. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, it could be another 600 years before we get another one of these. So we do not know how to predict uh, the, these cycles. Now the work that Zarkova is doing is very interesting and may be a way forward. However, yes. it's not been established yet. Yes, yes, she's doing some very interesting work, but it, it needs for um, more peer review. Is that what you're saying? Well, it needs other people to start doing the same sort of analysis or similar sorts of analyses and see whether it comes out to be the same answer. Right. But the problem is it took a very short period of, uh, to establish this trend. And as you saw with those solar cycles, uh, we've got a downward trend. So if you take a, a model that is established on a downward trend, then what you're going to get at the end is going to go to zero. So that's what I think has happened with with her study. Right, right. Okay, if if it's not the sun that has caused the recent increases in global temperatures, then what is it? Okay, we have three possibilities. We could go to figure eight. Um, first of all, it's a natural could be a natural phenomena. It could be the sun, volcanoes, changes in the orbit, etc. 
It could be human caused, that's the emissions of aerosols, greenhouse gases, and changes in land use. Uh, and the last possibility is a combination of the two. And I believe it's exactly that. However, um, the uh, human sources are the ones that are dominating at the moment, mainly the emission of carbon dioxide and aerosols. Okay. So um, I'm still not seeing uh, uh, figure eight. Yeah, it's coming up there. I think you just need to to give it give it a minute to show up on your your screen. I think so. I think that maybe I should re refresh it or something. No, I, I don't know if you need to do that. You could do that. You could give it a refresh and just make sure that you mute it. It came up. Okay. Okay. You see so what it does? It does a little on. lag when when you're looking at it and you're doing it at the same time. You receive a lag. No problem. Um, on the left of this figure, you can see the various uh, contributions to um, our uh, global temperatures, the inputs. And the dominant factor here is the green line, which is the uh, greenhouse gases. Um, and if you look very carefully, there's an orange line there just waving around. Uh, that's the, the solar co component. And actually, I think that's a fairly optimistic solar component. You see, it's very, very small with the black carbon or the um, greenhouse gases. Um, the, the jagged lines are uh, volcanic eruptions. They tend to cool the planet for a period, but very short period, only for a few years. And then you have other aerosols uh, effects that help to cool the planet. So if you put all those together uh, on the right, you can uh, take, see what the natural uh, things would do. And that is shown in blue here. And you can see if anything, they're slightly down or at least stable. It's only when you add in the human component, that's that pink line, that you actually fit the data that we, we've got. So it, it actually seems to require the um, uh, influence of carbon, the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and the aerosols, those, those are important, to produce the data that we've actually seen over the years. Okay. Okay, here's another one. Um, but CO2 makes up such a small proportion of the atmosphere. How can it be effective? Okay, this is a very, uh, can we have the next figure, please? Mm -hmm. um, this is a very old argument that's been used for many, many years. Yes, yes. CO2 only make, makes up 0.04% of the atmosphere. How can it be making any effect? Well, uh, we can do a little thought experiment if we, if we, if we try. Um, and the, the issue is, it's not how much, what percentage of the atmosphere there's there, it's how much there's there. It's the partial pressure, not the, not the percentage. So you can do a little thought experiment to figure that out. So let's take a, a volume, a, a little tube, uh, with no gas in it at all, and we'll put in 100 IR photons from the left and shine it through that tube, and guess what? 100 photons come out the other end. Okay, now let's fill that tube with a gas that is transparent to infrared. So you put 100 photons in from the left, and 100 photons will come in from the right. At the moment, there's no uh, greenhouse gases in here. Okay, so next, we'll take the, those transparent gases out and replace them with the greenhouse gas um, at the same pressure. So there's 100% greenhouse gases in there. We'll put enough greenhouse gases in there that only 50 uh, photons make it through the tube. So 50 come out in the right. So what do you think happens when we mix uh, B and C? We're going to have twice the pressure, and mm -hmm. only 50% of the gas is going to be um, the greenhouse gas. If we put in 100 photons from the left, the transparent gases in there are going to make no difference whatsoever. The greenhouse gases are going to act exactly as they did before because there's exactly the same number of them. So 50 is going to come out the other end. But now you've only got 50% of the atmosphere being uh, greenhouse gases. Now, we could add four more lots of the transparent gases there, and you'd have the same effect. You could have a hundred times the amount of transparent gases there, and you still have the same effect. So, um, there you'd only have one percent of the atmosphere being greenhouse gases, and you'd still have a hundred photons going in the left, and fifty photons coming in the right. So, it's not the percentage of the atmosphere that is carbon dioxide or any of the other greenhouse gases. It's the partial pressure. How many um, 
molecules of carbon dioxide will an infrared photon hit trying to escape from the Earth. Now, the distance for um, a infrared photon to travel in the Earth's atmosphere at, at the sea level before it hits the carbon dioxide a, a molecule is about 70 meters. Okay. Now, if you, uh, and so it hits that carbon dioxide molecule, two things, can, uh, one of two things can happen. It can be scattered forward or it can be scattered backwards. So in that, after that 70 meters, half of the infrared photons are being hit back towards the Earth. Now, if you had a uniform density atmosphere, the height of the atmosphere would be about seven kilometers, if I remember correctly. So that's uh, 100 of those 70 kilometer uh, lead. So if you take half of the um, infrared photons out um, <clears throat> every one uh, for 100 steps, do you know how many photons uh, of infrared will escape the atmosphere without uh, being um, interfered with by the, uh, by the carbon dioxide? It's one, one in one million trillion trillion. It's two to the power of 100, in fact. Wow. So, uh, so very, very few of those photons are going to escape uh, and cool the planet without having to interact with the, the greenhouse gases. Uh, so um, there's plenty of carbon dioxide there uh, to uh, help keep us warm. Okay. So I'm, I'm very certain that some of my subscribers are going to ask if you could say that in layman's terms. Okay, um, let me think. Basically, the distance that a, a, uh, an infrared uh, photon, a, a, a heat energy photon can uh, travel uh, is not very far in our atmosphere before it hits the carbon dioxide atom uh, molecule. If it hits the molecule, it can be scattered. But it's got an even chance of being scattered backwards as to being scattered forward. Okay. So imagine how many interactions like that is going to happen. So for in order for an infrared photon to escape for, to cool the planet, it has to bounce around in the atmosphere. In fact, it's called a random walk. Uh, so it has thousands of interactions before it can escape. Uh, so that keeps it warm. It's like having a blanket. Right. So a blanket keeps it warm because it doesn't allow the heat to escape uh, so quickly. And so uh, that's what the, uh, the greenhouse gases are doing. They're, they're acting as a blanket. Okay. So, okay, I have another one here. Water vapor is also a greenhouse gas, and there's a lot more of it. So why is CO2 the driver? I think maybe we kind of covered that a little bit. Can you explain um, to the viewers about um, the water vapor? I actually haven't covered that. The water vapor is indeed a very strong greenhouse gas and there's a lot more of it. There can be, but the trouble with it is that there's, um, it's very variable in the atmosphere. You can have 0% of it in the atmosphere or you can have 4% of it in the atmosphere. Um, and so there's some places where it's not effective at all. There's other places where it's very, very effective indeed. But the point is that the um, water vapor is a secondary greenhouse gas. And what I mean by that is that the amount of it in the atmosphere depends solely on the temperature or mainly on the temperature of the atmosphere. So if the atmosphere warms up, you can keep more water vapor in the atmosphere. If the atmosphere cools down, it, uh, you can, uh, uh, there's less water vapor in the atmosphere. So mm -hmm. the, um, it acts then to amplify the effects of the other greenhouse gases. So if we have an increase in carbon dioxide, for example, and that heats the planet a little bit, then we'll get an, uh, a positive feedback because more water vapor will be in the atmosphere, also acting as, as a greenhouse gas more effectively. And so you'll get more buildup of heat uh, than you would have got just from the increase in carbon dioxide alone. Uh, similarly, if you cool the temperature a little bit, some of that water would, uh, water vapor would uh, condense out of the atmosphere, so there'd be less uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and uh, the temperature would drop more than the drop in, in the carbon dioxide would normally allow. And um, CO2 lasts longer than um, water, correct? Right. 
yeah, the lifetime of water vapor in the atmosphere is approximately hours to days. The uh, lifetime of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is decades to hundreds of years. Okay. So it's more effective for longer. So if we double the amount of water in the atmosphere, what happens? It would rain. Simple as that. If you, you, put, you pump as much water vapor into the atmosphere as you like, uh, and up to the saturation point, and soon as it, re it moves up in the atmosphere, the convective layers will take it up. Uh, it gets slightly cooler. It will just rain. Right. So you can put, pump as much uh, water vapor in the air as you like, and it won't change things because it will just precipitate out. Now, if you double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, that will not precipitate out, and that will increase the amount of uh, that'll increase the temperature, which will increase the amount of, uh, of water vapor, uh, and so that will increase the temperatures uh, more. Okay. Um, why does CO two control the temperature even though there's less of it? Because well, because um, see, carbon dioxide is well mixed in the atmosphere, up to tens of kilometers above the surface. There's the same proportion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Water vapor, as you go up, as it gets cooler, eventually it condenses and freezes out. So above a certain altitude, which if I remember correctly is about something like seven or eight kilometers, there is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than water vapor. It basically forms clouds and then rains as you go up, or freezes and forms snow and, uh, as you go up. So the, the point is, is that um, the carbon dioxide for, uh, um, will be still there acting as a, um, as a, a uh, um, greenhouse gas well above the altitude that water vapor is no longer effective. And it's the top layers of the atmosphere that determine the cooling because that's where the infrared radiation escapes into space and that's what cools the planet. It's all this bouncing around just keeps the planet warm. Um, the, uh, uh, the only way, way it can cool is for those infrared photons to reach a place where they can escape to space. And that space is, is um, uh, that, that area is controlled by carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, and various other greenhouse gases. But carbon dioxide of those is by far the most abundant. Okay, um, there's another idea for a link between solar activity and global temperatures and uh, extreme weather, like rain. Um, there's saying that uh, there's more, since uh, we're in a solar minimum, where, well, they say we're in a grand solar minimum, that uh, there's more uh, particles to form raindrops. Uh, they say uh, we have a 19% increase in cosmic rays, Highly charged particles, uh, right. which is causing more rain. Uh, something like this. As the solar magnetic field weakens towards solar minimum, the protective um, layer of the solar system, the heliopause, moves in. And so cosmic rays, which come from outside the solar system, basically are from supernova uh, explosions, uh, can get penetrate into the inner solar system more effectively. Um, and that's, that's true. Now, the question is, is does that produce more clouds? And they've done some experiments at CERN about this, and people have made a lot of fuss about this. However, a couple of things uh, become very apparent. First of all, you've got figure 10 up there, which shows the, um, the neutron monitor flux. Now, when a cosmic ray hits the atmosphere, it produces a shower of neutrons. So this is a measure of the amount of cosmic rays coming in. And you can see for the last 60 years, basically, the level of the peak level of cosmic rays has not changed at all. There's a lot of variability, and that's in proportion to the size of the solar cycles. But nonetheless, the overall amount of cosmic rays have not changed very much indeed at all. Now, there's some other problems with this idea. First of all, that the cosmic rays are absorbed very high up in the atmosphere. And that's much above the level where clouds are formed. The CERN experiment has shown that these nucleation centers that the cosmic rays potentially form are very, very small. 
They have to grow by something like a factor of 100, and there's no mechanism to make them grow. They also have to move lower in the atmosphere uh, to the level where there's some water vapor for them to, to create the clouds and the raindrops and the ice particles that, that uh, you want to do to create clouds. And the last part of it is, is that, yes, clouds, when they form, create um, uh, a higher albedo, so they cool the planet, which is what these folks seem to want. However, they're ignoring the other side of this, is that the clouds sit over the warm land and keep them warm. You know that a cloudy night, the, the temperature remains higher than when it, you've got a starlit night, because the, uh, the radiation can escape to space more easily uh, with, with no clouds there. So, you, uh, so the net effect of clouds is relatively small overall. So you can't really uh, say, uh, say um, that this is going to produce a major effect. And with, if the fact that the cosmic rays haven't changed that much, it's not going to produce any effect at all. And um, you know, I watched um, the – Jasper Kirkby has um, some lectures. He has a few videos. I posted um, a nature podcast. I started back when he first started out um, in 2011. And I think I have one from 2014 and then 2016. And he himself says – that um, the project will help them sharpen the amount that we will warm. He said it will warm, but this will help us uh, try to find out exactly how much. Well, of course, people are mm -hmm. saying uh, that he's been threatened that to listen to his old stuff from 2009 or, or 2011. Don't pay attention to his new stuff. And uh, we all know that's crap. You know, he has, he has himself said that global warming is real and that cosmic rays has nothing to do with any of uh, this uh, ice age and all that kind of stuff. It's more of the uh, misrepresenting uh, people's sci the work of scientists is kind of uh, one of the things that deniers like to do. One thing that might be interesting in in the, in the element of cosmic rays is that there's a very very high up, very high up. There is something called noctilucent clouds. Mm -hmm. Now they seem to have changed over the last few years. We're not sure why. Now there may be some argument that the uh, cosmic rays may be producing those. But uh, at the moment, nobody really knows. But we also have more equipment for measuring cosmic rays now we didn't have a long time ago. Uh, yeah, we have spacecraft that have monitors on board. We have more neutron monitors on the ground. Yeah, so yeah, that, that is in fact the case. Yes, yeah, so, so people will, have, will see more information about cosmic rays now. And some might think, okay, I'm seeing all this information, something might be wrong, and that's, that's not true. It is because now the data is starting to come in because of the new satellite missions. Okay. That's always the data with new data, but then that it seems to be producing new results, uh, um, but it's just new data. There was this incident where they said they found the coldest place on Earth in uh, Antarctica. All that was was a new measurement in a place that they hadn't measured before. It wasn't that the Antarctica had suddenly become that. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to discuss a few claims made by deniers over the years. Uh, you don't have to go uh, deep into it. Um, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go ahead and pull up your other one, your other graph, mm -hmm. so we can have this ready to go. But um, uh, models are unreliable. Well, yes. Um, the problem there is is they are not often comparing the models with what the models are trying to predict. The first problem with models is, um, well, there's two issues with models. First of all, you can check whether they are working properly by providing them with all the old data. Uh, the you know the the major sunlight what's happening with the um, volcanoes what's happening with the Enso cycle and all the rest of these sorts of things and then see what temperature they came up with 
and does that agree with the observations back at that time? So there's a sort of a test there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and most of the models, of course, pass that test, otherwise they wouldn't be any, they wouldn't be very useful models. Um, so, um, but the problem with the, uh, um, the, the things that they show, they'll often show this hundreds of models all going, you know, diagonally across the page upwards, and then some average of the, uh, uh, of the overall um, uh, uh, consortium of models, and then show some data that looks completely different from it. And then figure 11 should show, should show that if you've got figure 11 available. Yeah, it should um, be up. You can't see it. Not yet, but let me refresh. Yeah, give it a refresh. Let me make sure no, I've got, everybody I've else. Got 10. Let me see if people are seeing. Are you guys seeing uh, figure 11? Figure 11 not up yet. Okay. Oh, I know what I need to do. One sec. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing and go back. Anyway, what they're basically, basically what they're doing is they're comparing um, the uh, models of surface temperatures with those taken at alti high altitudes in the atmosphere. Um, the general trick that they use is to compare the surface models with data from the satellites and the balloons. All often are touted to be much more accurate, and they're not. Uh, satellites don't even measure temperature, they measure um, microwave irradiance. Uh, so they get an effective temperature. Here we go, yeah. You see it um, now? And so, okay. You yeah, can you see figure 11? This, okay, if great. you look at these plots, there, uh, if you look at these, you can see um, in blue and green, these are, are measurements, the data from balloons and satellites. So these are taking temperatures four or five, six kilometers up in the atmosphere, where we all know it's colder. These mm -hmm. models are surface temperatures. And the surface temperatures are determined by interactions between the land and the ocean and the, the, the air near it. The um, satellite measurements and the balloon measurements are taking measurements kilometers up in the atmosphere, where the mechanisms for heating and cooling are completely different. Uh, so they're comparing apples and oranges. Now, on the right of that picture, I've got an apples and apples comparison. Here is uh, the precasting uh, effect of the models. And you can see there's the data and the, compared it with the models, and it looks pretty good. Then you have all these models, and they have different scenarios. Because you don't know what is going to happen with volcanoes or the ENSO cycle or any of the other random effects. Uh, you can't model uh, what's going to happen precisely. So what you do is you run your model different, many different times with different assumptions. And so you get a big wide And so what they do is they say, oh, well, they have 100 models and none of them got it right. Well, they had 100 models because they had 100 different scenarios. And only one of those scenarios, or maybe none of those scenarios, correspond to what actually happened in that period. Correct. So the models, <coughs> if given the right data, will produce the appropriate measurements. And then we, don't know um, what, we then, discussed, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry, then, go ahead. As we don't know what's going to happen, the model cannot be precise. And so what they do is they do these consortium uh, models where you make all these different assumptions and take the average. And those have been pretty good. Um, I remember um, the other day we talked about Mueller. Uh, he was a denier, and then he started um, his own thing. Can you tell uh, the viewers about that? Uh, uh, one, that was a very interesting case. Um, Muller right at uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, was uh, one of the darlings of the denialist community um, because he was very critical of the IPCC in the way they did the analysis and the way the NOAA and NASA and uh, the University of uh, uh, East Anglia did their analyses of of uh, of um, uh, the temp global temperatures. And only comparing the data for while a given instrument was working at a given location. If they change the instrument or change the uh, um, location, 
they, he would start a new time series and compare how the temperatures changed over those shorter periods of time, and then added them all together. So uh, he thought that this would give a completely different answer. And in fact, he was even funded to do this by the Koch brothers, who were hoping very much that it would give a different answer. After three or four years of effort, he came up with exactly the same answer as NOAA, NASA, and the UK Met Office got. Uh, and so uh, his, uh, uh, his conclusion is that indeed global warming was acting exactly as uh, was, uh, the other groups had been, been saying, and that um, uh, a lot of the prediction, a lot of the uh, 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 critics were exactly wrong. Strangely enough, the Koch brothers then stopped funding him. I can't think why. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, uh, and of course, so he's now uh, a supporter of the global warming uh, anthropogenic theory, uh, and uh, uh, he is the persona non grata amongst all the denialists. Yes, in, in his all this information is is free to the public to see. He, he has uh, the Berkeley Earth stats. He has it all up there. Um, uh, we also talked about how. Um, when they thought there was a hiatus, the models were correct, but when the models are showing that it's not, that we're warming, then the models are unreliable. Well, no, no, I think actually what they're saying is seeing uh, that the data is unreliable. It's not showing what they originally said that there was this hiatus. So now the data is unreliable. It was really amusing to my way of thinking that this data was just fine while it was showing that there was a pause in global warming or global warming had slowed. Uh, and soon as it, soon as we got this warming trend from 2010 on to 2016, uh, that actually put the slope right back up where it was before. In fact, maybe even accelerated it somewhat. All the data is suddenly unreliable and been tampered with. Right. Um, very, very hypocritical of them. Yes, yes. Uh, here's another. Uh, climate sensitivity is low. Uh, okay, um, let me see. If, uh, well, you can act, the, the most has been measured, measured many different ways, and the results will come out be, to be about two to four. Um, there's some uncertainties in it, but a lot of the climate denialists claim it's one, and so doubling the amount of carbon dioxide would only increase, decrease, increase temperatures by one degree centigrade rather than two and a half or three degrees centigrade. But you can actually do a rough back of the envelope calculation um, of uh, what the effect is. We know that um, since records began, uh, that carbon dioxide has increased by about 40%. Since temperature records began, carbon dioxide has increased about 40%. In that time, um, global temperatures have gone up about 0.9 degrees centigrade. So you can just divide 0.9 by 0.4 and you get two and a half, or 2.25. Uh, so that says that the climate sensitivity is about at least 2.25. Okay. Now that's a very rough way of doing it, but nonetheless, uh, it does indicate that it's a lot larger than many of the denialists claim, and pretty much on par with what the IPCC and various other uh, organizations uh, have derived. And what they, they predicted, um, uh a while ago is starting to happen. You can you can see it happen. I, I saw an article a while back, I think it was way earlier uh, this year, that um, was saying that there was a model prediction 30 years ago that it is, it is showing that it is coming true. And I think it was about the atmosphere. Okay, I'm gonna- uh, that, was, that, was, yeah, that was the Hansen model uh, that he presented to Congress, I think in, uh, 1989, uh, he, and there he produced three different scenarios, uh, A, B, and C. Now, uh, if you take the assumptions that he took and see wh which of those three scenarios was closest to what actually happened in the subsequent years, his model is pretty much uh, spot on, which is sort of ironic because it's a very simple, straightforward model, uh, mm -hmm. and it, it's not too far off from the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, glaciers are growing. Oh, right. Well, I invite anybody just to Google before and after pictures of glaciers and find me one that's growing. The other thing is that they may be lengthening 
but the amount of ice in the glaciers are all dropping. And you can see this from the, some of the results from the GRACE satellite, which measures the mass of ice in the Arctic and Antarctic and in various uh, mountain ranges. And all of those, all of those values is going, are going down. Okay. Um, sea level rise is exaggerated. Well, again, you could they sometimes choose individual um, uh, tide gauges and say, "Oh, look, this one's going down." The problem with tide gauges is, is they're hooked to the land, and sometimes land is rising and sometimes land is falling, and so you can get um, very strange results from individual tide gauges or subsets of tide gauges. You've got to take a large number of them and actually understand what's happening to the land. For example, um, Scotland, uh, I come from the UK, if you haven't guessed from my lack of accent already, um, Scotland is rising, is going higher, and the southern, the southern part of England, where I come from, is getting lower. So if you have a tide gauge in um, uh, the south, south part of England, it's going to say the sea level is rising very fast. And if you have one in Scotland, it's going to say that sea level is dropping. So um, you've, got to, you've got to be very careful. Now, the um, best way of measuring this is these radar altimeters that are on some of the satellites, and those are showing a fairly steady rise. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was a study just published, I've forgotten who did it now, uh, but uh, the rate of rise from 1993 to 2004 was about 2.4 millimeters per decade. The rate from 2005 to the present is 3.5 millimeters per decade. So that's an increase of about uh, 25, uh, 20 percent over uh, that, that, that period in the rate of rise of sea level. Now, whether that will carry on or, or uh, accelerate, I don't know. We'll have to wait another 10 years to see. Right, right. Okay. Um, the medieval warm period was warmer. I've already put up the figures, so if you don't see it, you should refresh your screen. Yeah. We often see the figure that's on the left, which is basically pseudoscience. It's a, a measure of the temperature in the UK Midlands, which is the longest temperature record anywhere available. You note that it ends at the, at the beginning, at the end of the 20th century. Uh, it also was hand-drawn uh, as a matter of interest, based on how people felt that it, uh, the, 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 the plot should look. Um, and that would show that the medieval warm period is warmer than now. However, on the right, you can see some of the um, reconstructions. And those reconstructions have been done by from ice cores, tree rings, um, sediments, stalagmites, boreholes, all sorts of things have been put together to make that reconstruction. You see the different ones depending on what sort of things that they, uh, that they uh, use. And in fact, actually, just a quick aside, you look at the uh, lowest peak in the little ice age there, you can see it's at about 1590, like I said. Right. Okay. On, 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 uh, the dark line on the right shows the modern temperature record, and you can see that in, by 2004, which is the last point that they part plotted on here, it was already well above the uh, medieval warm period. And I put the 2016 point on this plot, and it's way above the um, medieval warm period. So that claim that the medieval warm period was warmer is utter nonsense. Okay. Uh, CO2 is plant food. Um, the idea here is that CO2 um, helps plants grow bigger. Now, that is true for some plants, in fact, for most plants. However, um, that's only under very tightly controlled conditions, i.e. you keep the soil most moisture at the right level, you add a lot of fertilizers and things to the soil. Um, in reality, uh, okay, so if you do that, then you might get a larger melon than you would have got otherwise when you grow a melon. Now, the problem is, is that the nutrition in that melon comes from the soil. And unless you put all those uh, chemicals in the soil, the amount of nutrition in that melon is going to be no more than th that large melon is going to be no more than within the small melon. So you just have to eat more melon to get the same nutritional value, okay. which is probably not good. Equally, with more carbon dioxide out in the wild, uh, there, there's nobody to, to water the trees or the, pl or the plants uh, or to add fertilizer to them. So they, uh, 
will suffer from other other problems, such as with because of warming, you can have more pests, weeds grow better um, in uh, these sorts of circumstances, uh, and uh, also um, you have droughts and floods that tend to to kill off a lot of the plants. So it's 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 in some circumstances it's good for you, it's good for them, particularly if you do it in a greenhouse. But if you do it out in the wild, or you're expecting a nature to um, to thrive, you may be in for a rude awakening. And then also, uh, the natural cycle adds and removes CO two to keep a balance. Now we are producing CO two without removing it. Right, that's the problem. Yeah, the oceans emit uh, carbon dioxide. The land and plants and animals emit carbon dioxide, uh, but they also take it in in about the same amount. We emit nine gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. Um, now the oceans take and land take up a bit of that, so the plants growing a bit larger, uh, and also the oceans becoming more acidic, uh, take out all, uh, four of those nine gigatons. But we add those extra five gigatons to the atmosphere every year. So although they keep on claiming that we only emit a very small proportion of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. What happens is we're keeping adding it again and again and again. And so that's why the concentration of carbon dioxide is increasing. Right. Okay. Uh, I have the figure up here. There's no correlation between CO2 and temperature. Oh, yeah, this is a beautiful one. Uh, the Often the claim is that uh, solar activity is much better correlated with carbon dioxide than uh, temperatures. Now, the red plot here is um, uh, the global temperatures. The yellow plot at the bottom is um, the solar cycle, and that doesn't look very well correlated to me at all. In fact, as you pointed out earlier, they're going in different directions. Yes. And the blue plot is the carbon dioxide, and as you can see, that's rising in, unif in lockstep with the uh, global temperatures. So yes, I think... Yes. Basically, that 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 uh, old chestnut uh, should be retired because it just isn't plain true. Right. This was something that we talked about, and I, I just really liked your answer to it. Uh, CO two was higher in the past. Um, would you like to answer it, or can I read uh, your answer? <laughs> you can read my answer uh, while I have a sip of tea. Okay, great, great. Uh, CO two was higher in the past. True. So what? If you want, if you like a planet dominated by insects and reptiles, keep on pu keep on pumping out more CO two. <laughs> I thought that was Sorry, it is very true. Uh, uh, people do not realize when they talk about that temperature was warmer in the past. They don't realize what what was going on during that time. We've not had CO at uh, this higher level. Since humans have walked the earth, exactly. That should be sobering to everybody. Yes, yes. It sh it really should be, and I, and I don't understand why it's not. Okay, I'm I'm trying to move along as fast as I can here. Are you okay? Or are we? Yeah, I'm, the tea you, has refreshed me. Is your your wife uh, calling you for dinner? She growled at me a couple times, but I ignored her. <laughs> Tell her we thank her. <laughs> Um, volcanoes emit more CO2 than humans. Oh dear. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is again an old chestnut that people keep bringing up. The uh, um, US Geological Survey keeps track of how much car carbon dioxide and other gases are emitted by uh, volcano volcanic activity around the planet. Um, and they estimate it is 1% or less of the emissions that humans put out each year. Now a big eruption may change that, but then again there may be years with no eruptions that hardly any is put out. So uh, it, it, it's um, an old chestnut. In fact, I think I did a video about this some years ago. Okay, you have 900 videos on your channel. I actually, you know, I read out but, your bio, but I also read uh, um, an introduction of you at um, um, somewhere you were speaking at in 2013. 
And I saw, I have not made it through all your videos. And, and <laughs> you have 900 videos on your channel. Okay, we're going to move along. Okay, um, but we're seeing record cold. That disproves warming. Okay, you've shown, put up figure 14. Thank you. Yes. Um, all that does is if, if the planet warms, all that does is it moves the distribution of temperatures that you see at any given time. Uh, to warmer. That doesn't mean you won't get any cold temperatures or cool temperatures or even some record temperatures, but a uh, record cool temperatures, but you'll get a lot more warm temperatures. And while that imbalance occurs, you know the planet's warming. And on the right here, I've got for the, at least for the United States, the relative numbers of, of record highs and record lows over uh, a period of a decade. And as you can see, for the last three decades, there's been more uh, warm uh, records than uh, uh, cold records. And in the last one, it's about a factor of two to one in the 2000s. So far, this um, decade is more like running three to one. I, I actually seen saw something from, I think it might have been from uh, the Weather Channel or NOAA or someone where they, they were saying, um, I think it was April or May, they're saying five to one. Some months, it, in fact, I think one month it was seven to one. Yeah. But over this is over a decade. So I, if, I, if you integrate it over the 2000s so far, it's something like three to one. Right. Uh, but uh, I, in fact, if you look at my um, Twitter channel, um, the uh, I, every month I do an update on the number of cold and warm records set during that period, and you can actually go to the NOAA. Uh, Climate Extremes page, and they, they will list it for you. Yes, I, I also have um, in the description, I have um, a, a great site um, I'm going to put up. It's, it's a state of the climate where it tells every month, it tells it for the years. It's got so much on there. I think it's from NOAA. Um, but I do have it saved, and I'm, I'm going to put it in the description for everybody to be able to look at, to see for themselves what because that's something that these people that are doing this let people know it's there it's free we're not hiding it we're not charging you for it it's right there for you to go see okay mm -hmm. uh, spring is not coming earlier i can i myself can say that that is not true that is very much not true in the washington dc area i actually was out here in the early 80s moved to California for a while and then came back here a few years ago. Uh, and the difference in the Cherry Blossom Festival is two weeks. From, from 1980, it was uh, late March, early April, and now it's middle March. In fact, the, this year, our cherry trees in our front garden were uh, starting to bloom at the beginning of March. Right. So th th that, that is complete and utter nonsense. And I've seen that pattern all the way around. And one of the things you're viewers can do is go to uh, Google and uh, Google planting zones. Uh, if you look at the planting zones from about 20 or 30 years ago, compare them with what they are today, and there is a comparison in that, in that set of pictures, um, you'll see that they've all moved uh, northwards across the United States. Mm -hmm. yeah, fact, there's I'm, a lot of changes. In fact, I'm uh, figs in my backyard here in Maryland which is not possible, wasn't possible in the 80s. And one of my neighbors has actually got cacti in her front garden. Wow. So that's how much the weather's changed. Yes, and then um, the southern half of the United States hasn't had a, wet, a winter in two years. It is, and maybe mm -hmm. it may have been longer, but it'll seem like you know the fall will come in and it'll seem like we'll get a little cool spell. And then the temperatures just go above average. Last year, in um, all the way from November all the way through February, we got a little cold in March and uh, April, and that that was something that has been cherry picked. There was some snowstorms in June and July, and I went back. I'm a researcher, so I went back, and it has happened before. It is not. It is not something that they can uh, contribute to. Um, an ice age, but um, when you look at globally, this is what 
I try to get people to understand, you know, uh, they say, well, it was unusually, you know, this, this August was, that was something I heard a lot about August. It was cool in August, you know, and where I live, the, that, that does not um, account for the rest of the world. Climate change is called global. It's global. It has nothing to do with where you stay at. You have to check right. out That's all of it. You see on YouTube, for example, many people say, oh, it's snowed here. It proves that global warming isn't happening. Um, uh, that, that, that is, you know, low, your local weather is not indicative necessarily of global climate trends. Correct. Okay, I'm gonna, um, since we've been on for a while, I'm gonna skip past some of these and I'm gonna go on because um, you, you, I sent you some videos of uh, Valentina Zarkova's interview and I sent you some videos of John Casey, uh, some of interview that he did and uh, some lectures. I read the, the book of his, Dark Winter, and I'd like to uh, start discussing that. I think that we basically have covered a lot of uh, evidence for climate change here and right. you know if we keep talking about the, the what these uh, myths and stuff are you know it's just a broken record so um right well actually i think that you covered um a part of the interview with zarkova um but if you could uh just comment just give your commentary on um the video and uh, things that were said? Well, as I said, Zarkova's um, work is interesting, but not it's not established science yet. So people that are, are putting it out as though this is now the fa a fact are just deluding themselves and deluding others. Um, we've had, as I said, people before come up with solutions to the prediction of the solar cycle many, many times, and every single time they've been wrong. Now, she may be right for the first time, in fact, actually, I had some ideas very similar to that back about 10 years ago, but it, it's not uh, established yet, and it will take a lot of work and effort and probably many solar cycles uh, to uh, establish whether she's correct or not. My guess is that she, like all of those before her, are going to come up with the same problems as they did before. I was disappointed. I was very pleased, first of all, that she... Um, when asked, said that she didn't believe in the electric universe. I thought that was good. Yes, she believed yes. In uh, I was very disappointed that she fell into the trap of calling the Mona Minimum uh, equivalent to the Little Ice Age uh, and claiming that all the cold weather back then uh, was due to the Mona Minimum, which it wasn't, and therefore projecting that if the solar cycle gets uh, into so-called Grand Minimum, that we will have an ice age and we certainly will not. So I th I th on some things, she was very shaky scientifically. On the modeling and such like, of course, that's her specialty. Uh, it looked very interesting, but again, it's not established as yet. Correct, okay. Um, she said that there would be no sunspots, no activity whatsoever, and no active regions, no CMEs. Um, right. Um, well, that, that's the that's completely wrong. That was one of the things she was shaky on. She doesn't seem to know a great deal about the sun, I'm afraid. Uh, we had a, 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 min, a, a mission, uh, I mentioned it earlier, called Yoko, uh, which I had an instrument on. And it uh, took very fast rate movies of, uh, of the sun uh, in x-rays. Now, we were stunned just how active the so-called quiet sun was when there were no sunspots around, uh, uh, that the sun was still doing, admittedly on a much smaller scale and much less energetic scale, the things were changing and uh, um, uh, continuously everywhere. Bright points were blowing, uh, producing little flares, uh, large-scale re reconnection of the large-scale magnetic field was going on in the sun. All sorts of things were happening that we didn't know about until we got this very high cadence. And now with the sort of dynamics observatory getting even higher cadence, you can go to look at some of their data, even in the quiet sun, and it's fascinating stuff. Yes, our, our uh, sun is much, very active right now. Now, the other thing is that she said about chronal mass ejections and sunspots. 
Coronal mass ejections do not necessarily, in fact, rarely come from sunspot regions. They come from filament eruptions. Those are quiet sun features. And you get coronal mass ejections all the way through solar minimum, admittedly at a somewhat lower rate, but nonetheless, they're there. And so, again, she's completely wrong on that. They're, that, that, uh, um, they're, uh, um, uh, that, that, that there's a, uh, a no activity around when there, there's um, uh, when you're going to solar minimum. In fact, we're we're supposed to be most of the way to solar minimum at the moment, mm -hmm. and we just had the largest flare um, uh, of this of this cycle, and I believe the last one. We had an X nine point three flare, which is um, twice as large as any flare that we've had uh, so far this cycle. And we I think we have to go back to two thousand and four. We have a flare of equivalent size. Uh, from the sun, and here we are uh, with some days that are almost spotless around on the sun. There's some, some huge sunspots on the sun at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, which we're active. surprised. Mm -hmm. One thing I've noticed that I, I find to be a little bit deceiving, it really bothers me. Um, there was a video, and they showed the sun in 2014. And then they showed the sun now. Well, not exactly right now. It was a, it was a, maybe a month or two back, something like that, when the sun was very, very quiet. Around uh, January, February, March, it was very, very, very few sunspots, and they showed the sun now and the sun in 2014. And that is very deceiving because the sun was in solar maximum in 2014 so right. when we go into solar you don't even have to show a solar minimum from now you can go back to the solar minimum before the maximum and the sun will look like that that's what the sun looks like at a quiet phase and they were showing this to say we're going into a grand so this proves it you see how the quad see how it looks the sun is going into solar hibernation is what john casey likes to call it and that is very deceptive they ain't, they ain't seen nothing yet, because when the sun is in solar minimum conditions, normal solar minimum conditions, it can go months without having a single sunspot anywhere. Right. And yes. in fact, uh, you know, the previous solar minimum from 2006 to 2010 was the longest and quietest solar minimum uh, in, uh, uh, that, that we know about. Uh, so from that point of view, the, um, the, uh, uh, doing comparisons like that are, is just plain silly. I could probably show you a plot from 2014 near solar maximum where the sun would look less busy than it is now. Uh, so because the sun is highly variable. Sometimes one half of the sun is just covered with sunspots and the other side is blank. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you could, you, there is probably some spotless days back in 2013, 2014, 2015. Uh, and there's more of them now, but there is also some very high levels of activity now. And you can pick and choose. It's, it's again, cherry-picking data to right. do something like that. Yes. And, and, and until you, you won't know that there's a new cycle. You won't know that you're out of solar maximum until the new cycle starts. Now, one interesting thing that your, your uh, um, uh, viewers may not know is that we've already seen the first sunspot from solar cycle 25. It appeared in December of this year. Of last year, um, uh, December twenty first, if I remember correctly. Uh, so, and it was in the southeast quadrant. It was not a nice little sunspot group that appeared, reverse polarity, uh, and that. So that was a solar cycle at a high latitude. That was a solar cycle twenty five. So solar cycle twenty five is beginning to start up already. Now we may maybe several months before we get another small region come up, or it may be a couple of years before. But the the regions are beginning to 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 to, to uh, produce and the fact that, that it came that early to my way of thinking might indicate that the next cycle is going to be larger. Okay. Um, let me get down here because you just <laughs> covered you just covered everything. So I have to uh, right here. Um, the temperature was reduced 1.5 C during the Monda minimum, but we're already but we were already in a little ice age. Uh, the global yeah. temperatures may, and, and for, for us, how much would we have to drop in temperature to get to 
uh, uh, monitor minimum temperature? Well, uh, basically, uh, a monitor minimum would uh, offset about 10 to 15 years worth of global warming. So if we went into a monitor minimum now and it went I'll ask it to the end of this century, uh, the temperature at the end of this century, assuming we carry on emitting the carbon dioxide at the same rate, would be the same as it, it would be now if it was uh, uh, 2085. So you're saving 15 years by going into a monitor minimum. Basically, it makes very little difference in, 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 uh, at all. Um, so from that point of view, it's not really, uh, really going to be any effect whatsoever. Okay. Or very little effect, I should say. I'm going to skip past some of this stuff. All right, let's move on to uh, John Casey's interview. Um, I, I watched, like I said, I, um, I sent you a, a video of an interview, and then I watched some of his lectures, and I read the book Dark Winter. Upheaval is basically about volcanoes and stuff like that. I'm more interested in what he's what he is trying to say, what is his evidence, since he is the source to most of these people for their Ice Age claims then uh, you know, I, I don't feel the need to um, talk to go through them. I, I like to go to the source. Where did this information come from? So. Uh, yeah, beat to me uh, because uh, I know nobody else that knows uh, things of, of this 206 year cycle. I think he just made that up out of whole cloth. Um, um, and then he just basically um, springboards from that, basically saying that um, if we had a, a Dalton minimum in, in the early 19th century, then 260 years later, we're going to have a Dalton minimum in the next, for the next 20 or 30 years. And if there's no 260-year period, uh, then that's nonsense. And these, these periodicities are not exact science anyway. They're, they're made up uh, on basis on very little data. So you can make any claim you like, and the problem is, I'm sure Casey and many of the others, suspicious observers, um, Piers Corbin um, and uh, Aris Batsov, uh, all claim that, that this current cycle were going to be was going to, 24 was going to be not there, and it is there. Uh, so they're just moving one one fur cycle further out, right? And they'll keep doing this. So if 26 appears, uh, they'll just say, "Oh well, we mean 27," and and. Yes. Uh, you know, after a time, we've all died, and nobody will remember what they've said. <laughs> yes, in in the book Dark Winter, he he talks about that. So um, he says he's a NASA and NOAA. Um, he was a NASA and NOAA scientist. Now, um, you you told me about uh, he he has a BS in physics and an MA in management, and you said right. that PhDs have a dif have difficulty becoming NASA scientists. Uh, he wouldn't get a job as a NASA scientist with those qualifications, I can tell you. Now, he may get maybe some sort of, you know, management uh, type that manages contracts or something of that sort, but that doesn't make him a NASA scientist. Right. Um, he, he has a lot of propaganda. Um, I have, I don't know if I have the picture here, but I, on one of his lectures, there is a, a piece of paper in front of the podium that says, don't trust the liberal media. Um, mm -hmm. most of everything he says is don't trust the media. He says there's no serious science behind it. It's been falsified. They're in error. And we all know that that's not correct. All that he's saying is, is incredibly wrong. And then he posts his, he has, uh, press releases that you, you pay for. Everything has to be paid for from this guy. But I want to go into some of the things that he was saying. Um, we're not seeing. Uh, may I make go ahead. Media, first of all. Yes. In terms of global warming, the media over reports the negative parts of this, the, the denialist case. If they were following the actual science, 99% of the, uh, the reports would be pro global warming, and less than half of them are. So that's, that's one what they problem. They, now, that's exactly the, what they do. That's exactly what they do. The second area is that a lot of the people that write in the media on these and other issues um, 
are not scientists or have no scientific training. I've suffered badly from trying to uh, talk to the media about issues, uh, scientific issues, and then seeing a report that says almost exactly the opposite of what I said. Now, maybe I'm not clear in what I say, but basically they didn't get the message. I'll tell you a little quick story, very quick story. When I was a national candidate, of course, our local newspaper in Portsmouth in England was very interested, and they interviewed me. I came down there, told them all about the experiment we had on, on the space shuttle, the Crowell and Helium Abundance Experiment, Chase, uh, and what it was doing and all the rest of this sort of stuff. And at the end of the interview, we, uh, the interview took a lot of time. I was describing all the things you had to go through as an astronaut candidate and such like. Uh, as I was just about to walk out, he said, oh, one final question. Um, what's helium? So uh, basically, he, uh, I found out that he was a sports correspondent who had been stuck with this astronaut interview. Uh, so he had no uh, uh, expertise in science whatsoever, and he was writing about our uh, British experiment on a space shuttle and the possibility of having a British astronaut on the space shuttle. And he knew nothing about the subject whatsoever. And we come against this a lot because... A lot of scientists don't want to be in, in media. It's mainly English majors and things of that sort that want to, but then they don't know about what science is real and what science isn't. And they can get fooled by this pseudoscience that people like uh, um, uh, Kerry put out. Um, so you have to be very careful. Yeah, the, the, media, the media definitely focuses on whatever will get them the most views. Uh, right, exactly. And and mainly that's negative stuff. You know, it, it's not about, you know, trying to fix anything, not about any of that. It's just about arguing and it's about politics. And, you know, there's a comment that was made about you that you were a fake scientist and that I found the most liberal person that doesn't like Donald Trump. What does, what does, does the politics and your personal uh, dislike of a man have to do with science. This is science. Science has nothing I to do with politics. I'm with the majority of people that don't like Donald Trump, but nonetheless, uh, I am neither a liberal. Actually, I'm, I've voted only conservative in my life. The trouble is, conservatives have lost their minds, so I don't vote anymore. Uh, a lot of and, scientists have a problem um, with Donald Trump. A lot, they, there was a march, for Christ's sake. Uh, yeah. But what he's doing to science is, is terrible. It, but, it, um, it is an you know, The, uh, the, the uh, uh, whole concept of me not being a real scientist, I invite him to look me up on LinkedIn. I invite him to look me up on ResearchGate and see all the publications I've done, see all the things I've, that our fellow scientists have said I'm qualified for. Yes. And I expect him to, I don't expect him to apologize, but he should. Yes. And, um, and uh, John Casey said himself that uh, one of the lectures I watched, he was, they, uh, they had a Q&A at the end, and uh, they asked how he came up with his RC theory, which is this 206-year cycle. Right. And he said that it was from solar proxies and all this stuff. Well, it turns out he, he did some, he was using China as a base. He didn't do this globally. And he also stated right then and there, I did not ask any other scientists for anything. I did not, I, it has not been peer reviewed. It is, it is just what, it is his predictions and what he thinks. It is not based on science at all. Yeah, they, 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 most of these uh, things that they put out uh, the uh, on channels like uh, the um, uh, uh, Grand Solar Minimum and things of that sort would never get past peer review in the first place. Right. That's why a lot of the global warming deniers don't publish what they're talking about, except for in, in a few cases where they've got a magazine run by the oil companies that will, will publish these things and then they're not peer reviewed anyway. Right, they're, they're fake, they're, they're not real. And they have a lot of people have been questioning peer review. And you know, I asked you about that. Was the peer review process broken? And you said it's fine, it's absolutely fine. It's just that people need to, what I think is people need to make sure what they're reading. When you go to a journal that's supposed to be peer reviewed, check it. There are places oh. you can go to check it. 
A peer review process is not understood by many people. A peer review process, you are supposed to check whether they've followed the scientific method, whether they've got clear diagrams, whether they support supply the data that supports their conclusions. You're not trying to tell, you don't do redo the analysis. You don't um, say, I don't believe this, therefore they can't publish it, or even though there's problems with it, they should publish it. it it's, it's actually a very um, uh, adversarial type of thing, and it's anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you don't know often who's doing what, uh, and so it's a very, very fair process, and it's very annoying. I've just had uh, two papers peer-reviewed for the Bulletins of the American Meteorological Society. One will be coming out in November. I think the other one will be coming out either in December or January, and it's taken you know, a year of going backwards and forwards with the referees to try and uh, make sure that I've done the things that they said I ought to have done, or I, and I'm not doing things that I think I don't have to do or shouldn't do. So it's a, it's a bargaining process, right. and it's very real, right. and people don't realize that. And that's the reason why they don't uh, submit to peer review, because they know that the process is, is it's not an easy process. It, right. it is just not. Okay. Um, he said, uh, we are not seeing what we were now. Now, I'm, these are claims. Uh, we have some claims that he made in his recent interviews, which which is basically he just re re says what he said with different dates. He says the same thing, but he says it with different dates. If you read the book Dark Winter, he says that. Uh, we are not seeing what we were told we would see during winter, which is less snow and much warmer temperatures. Now, he wrote this um, right before 2011. It was released around 2011. So during the these six years that have passed, um, you can see that we are seeing what we were told was going to happen, which is more extreme weather, which is happening and less snow not, and warmer temperatures not just that we've had five of the warm the five warmest years on record since that book has come out when he was claiming in that book and some of his other other press releases and such like that we were about to have a major turn turn down in global temperatures starting in 2011 okay. and it's done the exact reverse on up i Gone have an exact years. quote here um i have uh, i've taken screenshots of uh very Important things that I wanted to talk about with him just to quote him he says it is important to note from the table he had a table that the present 1990 to 2010 warm period will be the last record warm period for the next 206 years until the next bicentennial cycle renews between 21 2180 and 20 2211 now, in his so interview recently, he said, we just came out of peak warming in 2015 through 2016 period. This will be the last warm spike for 400 years. So he has just changed the date. If we were supposed to be in the last warm period, then we had what, what was, I think, was 2009 through 2016 were the, the 10 warmest years. Well, 1998 to 2016. Well, the, the point is, is that he, um, his 2011 prediction was wrong by 2014 because that was the warmest year on record. Correct. Um, the 2015 prediction was wrong that year because that became the warmest year on record and was wrong even further because 2016 became the warmest year on record. Mm -hmm. So we had three record uh, warm years in a row and so consequently, his predictions, uh, both predictions are completely and utterly wrong. And by his own yardstick, once you have a wrong prediction, you don't know what you're talking about. So right. I think we don't know, know what he's talking about. Okay, from here, he's, this was on February the 4th, 2011. The SSRC issues press release to 2011 showing that the next phase of global cooling has begun as marked by a record drop in Earth's ocean temperatures. Relying on NASA and NOAA satellite measurements and processed by other government contract organizations, 
The SSRC press release makes note of how this new record steep drop in ocean temperatures supports its May 10th, 2010 forecast for record for a record global temperature reduction by December 2012. Well, no, nothing that he said there is science. Exactly. You can make whatever claims you like, um, and um, unless you've published it uh, and it's uh, in writing and you haven't changed your mind like he seems to have done, that isn't science. You've not only got to say what's going, you've got to say why you're saying this, how it's, how it's relevant, and what's going to happen. And when that prediction comes true, you have to say, oh, I'm sorry, my model was wrong, and here's a revision of why I revised it and how I revised it. He's doing none of that stuff. He's just making wild claims that incorrect data that he's putting out is, is substantiate what he's saying. He's just doing um, public relations. He's telling lies and um, um, uh, trying to get uh, poor people uh, that don't really understand these things to believe what he's saying. Uh, and just by repeating it and repeating it and repeating it, mm -hmm. but science, what he's what he's doing, he's just making outlandish claims, yes. and I'm not remotely interested in what these out sort of claims. You know, I think there's there's a greater likelihood that we're going to go into a grand solar minimum than me reading his book. Right. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is something I wanted to discuss because I've seen a couple of people saying this. Only twice in history has a solar cycle had a double peak. That happened in 1910 and in 1790 to 1830. Major cold cycles followed these peaks. That's all we who study solar physics needed to see. This is a direct quote from John Casey. So, Mr. Solar Physics, what would you I say about that? I assume he's being that? amused because um, I, I, went, I, was, I showed that quote to a colleague uh, yesterday. I talked with her think, as well. We couldn't think of a solar cycle that had uh, less than two uh, um, peaks on it. Most of them have two, three, some like even have four peaks in them. And so what he's talking about is, is utter rubbish. Mm -hmm. It's not supported by the data. I can show you plots of the magnetic field for the last six cycles, and they've all got multiple humps. I can show you uh, daily sunspot numbers smoothed over um, a 28-day a rotation period of the sun, and uh, they there will be periods of activity, maybe three major activity, maybe three or four, uh, sometimes more, uh, in a solar cycle. If you do it by hemispheres, there's even more peaks. Mm -hmm. So. Um, he is not studying the sun. He is just making stuff up, which, as I say, is Correct. not science. You know, I could I could go on with this guy's stuff for who knows how long. Um, the concept that mankind's industrial greenhouse gas emission causes climate change has never shown itself to be a reliable predictor of climate change. It has been routinely wrong. Well, we showed a picture earlier where it was, so okay. I think that we can discount right from yep. the very start. Yep, we got we already got that one, and that's basically that's basically all that that I think that um, we need to cover today. I think that we have covered a wide range of these topics. Um, can always do it again, maybe one day. Who knows? <laughs> But, oh, I, if, if you're going to post this on YouTube um, and people have questions for me, either uh, post a question on there and I will answer them or come to my channel, uh, my either my YouTube channel or my Twitter channel and ask questions there and I'll be happy to respond to them. Okay, um, I just looked at the chat and I did forget something. Uh, we did say that we would uh, sh uh, very shortly kind of discuss the electric universe. Uh, Mr. Will Barger, uh, he is pushing the electric universe theory. And oh yes, oh yes, one thing. Uh, particles, there's more cosmic rays in the atmosphere, more highly charged particles which are penetrating the core of the planet and warming the planet. Wait, global warming well, is a fraud, but that is happening and that's warming the planet. 
to. First of all, we showed earlier that there are not more cosmic rays. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they've been constant for the last six years. But secondly, the kind of energy in a cosmic ray in an individual particle is high. But if you add them all up, it's a tiny, tiny amount. In fact, you would strike a match and you'd probably have more energy uh, from that match than you would from all the cosmic rays that come in in a, a few seconds. So uh, that, that's not going to heat any planet. And besides which, um, cosmic rays are absorbed in the top part of the atmosphere. How do you think cosmic rays are going to get through all the rest of the atmosphere and tons and tons and tons of rock to or heat the core of the planet? Uh, they're not just because they're not going to do it. Right. Simple as that. Right. So, um, um, so being again, a, a solar physicist, can you, can you, I'm sorry, uh, can you uh, kind of just give us a rundown of the uh, electric universe? You know, what, what are your thoughts on the, the electric universe? I assume you're not allowed to swear all right, all right, on this channel, right? Yes, you um, are. <laughs> I am a nerd with attitude. You can swear here. <laughs> my best because it's very unscientific. Um, no, one of the things that, that got me about this, the uh, electric universe, the annoyance with the electric universe is this idea that the sun is not being uh, emitting energy as a result of nuclear fusion in the core, but from some outside source of energy as it travels through the galaxy, uh, electric currents are coming into the sun and warming it and producing the heat that we see. Well, first of all, how do you explain all the neutrinos that are coming from this core of the sun, which are indicative of um, the nuclear fusion process? Secondly, um, if there was a huge flux, and it would have to be a very huge flux of energy coming into the sun, why haven't we, why haven't we detected it? If the Earth passed through that flux, we'd be va um, um, uh, evaporated in a few seconds. Um, and we have spacecraft all around the sun, uh, which should be detecting these things and we haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, so from that view, again, nonsense. Also, they had this theory that comets weren't actually um, ice and rock and, um, and um, uh, dust, but they were some electric phenomenon. Of course, we've now landed on one of them and found that it's made of ice and rocks and dust. Mm -hmm. um, so again, the electric universe theory falls at the first fence. So. I have no respect for the electric universe theory whatsoever. Correct. Now, a lot of in the universe are controlled by magnetic fields and electric currents and, and electric charge and things of that sort. Uh, but that's part of classic physics. Mm -hmm. They're rejecting physics. Right. And, and, and without and, classic physics, then um, Einstein's theory, Newton's theory, you know, those theory were used to orbit spacecraft, correct? Yes, uh, 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 absolutely. Now, one of the things I would like to ask the, the, somebody from this, how many lives have been saved so far and will be saved as a result of all this classic physics that's being used to predict where these hurricanes are going to go um, and to get people out of the way of them? Uh, compared with what the electric universe would be uh, predicting from those same sorts of for those same sorts of problems, the answer right. is we are saving an awful lot of lives with classic physics right now. Yes, I I, I read um, a a uh, physicist that went to the uh, one of the uh, symposiums that the conferences that they had. Uh, with the, I can't think of his name right now, but he was kind of like they had, they're, they're like the, the Thunderbolts project. Uh, he, yes, went, that's right. he went there and he asked them, um, was there any math or there, what about their theory would be able to help mankind, would change anything or, you know, what the math or anything like that. And they said, Oh, well, well, no, you know, we, we don't have that. And then he said, so what's the point? He said, well, a greater understanding of reality. That is. Well, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's not, uh, it's not been verified by any experiment. In fact, all the experiments have verified the classical physics. Uh, and so, until they, they come up with something in classical physics that's lacking, 
that they can explain mm -hmm. and explain all the other stuff at the same time, uh, then I'm not going to pay them any attention. But and the, science the things is that they always... Go ahead. about the sun is absolute nonsense. And science is always looking for advances. That um, that's the way I've always seen it. You know, they act like you know all this stuff is hitting, and and, and is there's this giant conspiracy of all the scientists and climatologists coming together to make us have a better world. How dare they? Idea? How dare they do that? You know. <laughs> do you have any idea how um, contentious scientists are? The, the fact, the thought of them being conspiratorial is almost laughable. I think if you put eight scientists, uh, six scientists into a room and ask them what day it was, you'd come up with seven different answers. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, the, the idea of a conspiracy is is laughable. Uh, we've we've to been be on here uh, before. You know, during history, science has made progress during history when people were were dying of diseases science comes along and science has science has brought us along with technology over the years there's always one point in time as you can go back where science came in and it helped us and and I think that's what's happening right now that it, it is time for people to let go of their belief, their biases um, and and understand that what we're trying what scientists are trying to do and what we all need to do is time to we have to evolve as a species we I think I think the issue here is more along the lines that um, science uh, is makes mistakes but it's self-correcting eventually, even when you make a mistake, somebody will come along. Newton came up with some very good laws of motion. Uh, they worked for 400 years until um, Einstein came along and pointed out there was a tiny error in them and that, that when you go fast enough, those laws of motion don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And somebody will probably come along and point out a problem with Einstein's work at some mm -hmm. point in the future and so on. Mm -hmm. you, you, uh, you, what I've been doing depended on the people back in the 1950s and the 40s and the, and the, and the 19th century working on the sun. Uh, so I, uh, I was able to do the work that I did dur dur during my period. And I'm hoping that other people who come along after me will take my work and take it further. So it's a self-correcting and building process, a constructive process. Cool. And so, yes, that's how you get those advances. But the point is that science, unlike most things, is self Yes, yes, it is. Well, I just want to thank you very, very much, Dr. Strong, for joining me. Um, I felt like uh, I knew this was going to be a wonderful interview. Um, I'm thank you for coming out of retirement for me for a little bit. I really appreciate it. I'm sure um, all the people uh, watching and the people who are going to watch will be very, very happy to see this. Um, you, you really, really, really. I uh, don't know how much this meant to me and my and my friends. You're more than welcome. And if, if people have any questions, just let me know. I'll be happy to answer them. And I'll make okay? sure that you have the link to this. And you can always chat in the chat box. I'm going to stay on okay, for a you. second, but I'll talk to you um, next time, Dr. Strong. Bye. Are you still there, Dave, with me? I don't know if Dave is still here. Hi, Dave, chat. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Oh, you have a, a, a echo there. Me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just know who like all left here. Thank you guys for for staying in here, hanging in here with us for this. I know it's late for some of you guys over there in the UK, especially <laughs> all you guys in the UK. Uh oh. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. I have to hang up. I see we're still live. <laughs> no, I had to hang up uh, my call with Dr. Strong. Yeah, we're still broadcasting live into the Hangout, though. Yeah, I know. Yep. I know. I was gonna. I was just telling everybody, uh, thanks for joining me and everything. I really, really appreciate you guys coming through here. Share, share this, guys. Hi, Groot. That was a Hi. great interview. That was fantastic and uh, covered Did you some. Enjoy? 
very inf interesting information there, uh, Tiffany. So thank you for setting that up. That was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for coming in here and helping me with the tech issues. I'll talk to you guys later on. Um, this will be uploaded as soon as it finished processing. And you guys have a great night. I have to prepare for Hurricane Irma coming up through here to kick my butt. Stay safe. I will. Bye. Good night, everyone.